Welcome to Shadow on the Trail, a Western novel. Written by Ken Cannon. Narrated by Richard Pulsifer. Copyright 2023 by BrooksAudiobooks.com and Shadowplay Communications, LLC. All rights reserved. No portion of this book may be reproduced in any form without written permission from the publisher or author. Visit brooksaudiobooks.com for updates on the availability of new books and a special free offer. Chapter 1 The sun was setting in the west over the Colorado Range, casting a purple haze over the timbered notches. The foothills, smooth and billowy, rolled down from the higher country with long velvety slopes and patches of aspens that blazed in autumn gold. Red vines splashed the soft gray of sage. Old white slides, a mountain scarred by avalanches, towered with a bleak rocky peak above the valley, sheltering it from the north. A young woman rode along the slope, her gaze fixed on the sweeping range and color of the mountain fastness that was her home. She followed an old trail that led to a bluff overlooking an arm of the valley. The lookout had once been a familiar spot for her, but she had not visited the place in some time. It was associated with serious hours of her life. Seven years before, when she was twelve, she had made a hard choice to please her guardian, the old rancher whom she loved and called father, who had indeed been a father to her. That choice had been to go to school in Denver. She had lived away from her beloved gray hills and black mountains for four years. Only once since her return had she climbed to this height, and that occasion, too, was memorable as an unhappy hour. It had been three years ago. Today, girlish ordeals and griefs seemed back in the past. She was a woman at nineteen, and she was face to face with the first great problem in her life. The trail came up behind the bluff, through a clump of aspens with white trunks and yellow fluttering leaves, and led across a level bench of luxuriant grass and wild flowers to the rocky edge. She dismounted and threw the bridle. The Mustang, accustomed to affection, nudged his sleek dark head against the girl, expecting reciprocation. She didn't oblige, so the horse bent his nose to graze. The girl was fixated on some slender white and blue flowers that swayed in the wind. They smiled wanly like pale stars out of the long golden grass. Daisies, she murmured wistfully, plucking a few of the flowers and holding them up to examine them as if searching for answers to the mystery surrounding her birth and name. Then she gazed dreamily at the distant ranges. Daisy, that's what the miners who found me asleep among the columbines in the woods named me. She spoke aloud as if hearing her own voice would bring clarity to her thoughts. Her father, the man who had raised her, had revealed so much about her past that day. She had always sensed that something was different about her childhood, something unexplained. No name but Daisy, she whispered mournfully finally understanding the longing in her heart. Not even an hour ago, as she dashed down the wide porch of White Slide's ranch house, she had encountered her father. He had always been kind and paternal towards her, but now there was a change in his demeanor. She saw him as Devin Standish, the pioneer and rancher, with his massive frame, broad face, hard, scarred skin, and blue fire in his eyes. Daisy, the old man had said, I've got news. A letter from Dylan. He's coming home. He waved the letter, his huge hands trembling as he reached out to place it on her shoulder. Dylan was his son. Buster Dylan was known as the Range, among other less flattering terms that never reached his father's ears. Three years ago he was sent away just before Daisy returned from school. As a result, Daisy had not seen him in over seven years. But she remembered him well, a tall, handsome, and wild boy who made her childhood unbearable. Yes, my son Dylan is coming home, said Standish, his voice breaking. And Daisy, I must tell you something. What is it, Dad? she replied, feeling the weight of his heavy hand on her shoulder. That's just it, lass, I ain't your dad. I've tried to be a father to you, and I've loved you as my own. But you're not my flesh and blood, and now I must tell you. He then told her the short story. Seventeen years ago, miners working at Standish's claim in the mountains above Middle Park found a child sleeping in the columbines along the trail. Near that point, Indians, probably Arapahoes coming across the mountains to attack the UTEs, had captured or killed the occupants of a prairie schooner. There was no other clue. The miners took the child to their camp, fed and cared for it, 
and after the manner of their kind, named it Daisy. Then they brought it to Standish. Daisy, said the old rancher, it needn't ever have been told and wouldn't have been told if not for one reason. I'm getting old. I reckon I'd never split my property between you and Dylan. So I mean for you and him to marry. You always steadied Dylan. With a wife like you'll be, well, maybe Dylan. Dad, interrupted Daisy, marry Dylan? Why, I don't even remember him. Haw, haw, laughed Standish. Well, you'll soon remember. Dylan's in Kremlin, and he'll be here tonight or tomorrow. But I... I don't love him, faltered Daisy. The old man lost his mirth. The strong-lined face resumed its hard cast. The big eyes smoldered. His pride was hurt by her objection as she reminded him of how sensitive the old man had always been about his son. Well, that's unlucky, he grumbled. Maybe you'll change. I don't think any girl could do much for a boy unless she cared for him. Anyway, you and Dylan will get married. He stormed off, leaving Daisy to ride her Mustang up the valley slope where she could be alone. Standing on the edge of the bluff, she suddenly realized that the peacefulness and solitude of her secluded spot had been disrupted. Cattle were bellowing below her and along the slope of old white slides and on the grassy uplands above. She had forgotten that the cattle were being driven down to the lowlands for the fall roundup. A great herd of red and white spotted cows was milling in the park just beneath her. Calves and yearlings were raising dust along the mountain slope, while wild old steers were crashing through the sagebrush, refusing to be driven down. Cows were running and mooing for their missing offspring. The cowboys' clarion calls rose melodiously and clearly. The cattle recognized those calls, and only the wild steers resisted. Daisy also recognized each call and which cowboy it belonged to. They sang, shouted, and cursed, but it was all music to her. Here and there a horse would dash across an open space where the aspen groves clustered. Dust would fly, and a cowboy would let out a hearty yell that rang along the slope, echoed under the bluff, and lingered long after the daring rider had disappeared into the steep thickets. "'I wonder which one is Wills,' Daisy murmured as she watched and listened, sensing a slight difference, a strange pause in her memory of this particular cowboy. She felt the change, but didn't comprehend it. One by one she identified the riders on the slopes below, but Morton Moore was nowhere to be found. She looked up at the towering mountain, half hidden by the gleaming aspens, and gazed across the grassy bluff. Suddenly a voice rang out from far to her left, high up on the scrubby ridge. "'Go along, you oo!' She watched as red cattle dashed down the slope, raising dust and tearing through the brush while letting out horse balls. A high-pitched and peeling yell followed. Daisy saw a white mustang flash out on top of the ridge, silhouetted against the blue sky with its mane and tail flying. The cowboy riding the horse seemed fearless, taking on heights and depths with ease. Even without seeing his face, she would have recognized him by his slim, erect figure and the way he rode. The cowboy spotted her and pulled the mustang to a stop, about to plunge down the slope. He lifted the horse, rearing and wheeling, before Daisy waved her hand. The cowboy spurred his horse along the crest of the ridge, disappearing behind the grove of aspens, and then coming into sight again around to the right. He slowed to a walk in descent to the bluff, and Daisy watched him come, feeling an unfamiliar sense of uncertainty in this meeting. She realized that she was seeing him differently from any other time in the years he had been a playmate, a friend, and almost like a brother to her. He had been riding for Standish for years and was a cowboy because he loved cattle and horses. Unlike most cowboys, he had been to school, had a family in Denver that often importuned him to come home, and seemed aloof sometimes and not readily understood. As Daisy stood there, a million thoughts raced through her mind. She watched as the cowboy slowly rode towards her, her concern growing with each passing moment. What would Morton think when he found out about the change that was about to come into her life? The thought made her heartache, but then again they were only good friends. In fact, lately they hadn't been as close as they used to be. In the excitement of the moment, she had forgotten his distant manner and the lack of attention she had been missing. By now, the cowboy had reached her level, and with the grace of a seasoned rider, he slipped out of his saddle. He was tall, slim, and had the small hips of a true cowboy. His shoulders were square, though not broad, and he stood tall and straight like an Indian. His hazel eyes were piercing, his features regular, and his face was bronzed. 
All men of the open had lean, strong faces, but in him there was a steadiness of expression that seemed to hide a deep sadness. "'Howdy, Daisy,' he greeted her. "'What are you doing up here? You might get run over.' "'Hello, Wills,' she replied slowly. "'Oh, I guess I can keep out of the way. "'Some of those steers are pretty wild. "'If any of them come over here, Pronto will leave you to walk home. "'That Mustang hates cattle, and he's only half broke, you know.' I forgot you were driving today, she replied, looking away from him. There was a long pause, and it seemed to last an eternity. What did you come for? he asked, his curiosity piqued. I wanted to gather columbines. See? She held out the nodding flowers towards him. Take one. Do you like them? Yes, I like columbines, he replied, taking one of the flowers. His keen hazel eyes softened and darkened. Colorado's flower. Daisy, it's my name, she said, looking at him again. Well, could you have a better one? It sure suits you, he said with a smile. Why, she asked, her curiosity getting the better of her. You're looking mighty fine today, he said, admiring her slender, graceful figure. Your head held high, skin as white as snow, and those beautiful blue eyes of yours. They turn purple when you're angry. She blushed at his compliments. Thanks, Morton. That's a new kind of talk for you, she said. He smiled. Yes, I am different today. She looked towards the setting sun, and the flush on her cheeks faded. I have no right to be proud. Nobody knows who I am or where I come from, she said sadly. Morton was surprised. As if that makes any difference. Standish isn't your dad, and that's okay. You were found as a baby, lost among the flowers. You've always been Daisy Standish, but that's not your real name. Everyone knows your story, Daisy. You must not let this knowledge sadden you, he said earnestly. She sighed. You don't understand. I've been happy, but I've always longed for a mother. I've never told you everything, she said hesitantly. Morton urged her to continue. What haven't you told me? he asked. Daisy hesitated, wondering how he would react to her news. She was afraid of what he might think of her potential marriage to Dylan Standish. Dylan Standish is coming home tonight or tomorrow, she finally said. Daisy stared off into the distance, not really seeing the sparse pines that lined old white slides. She was waiting for Moore to respond, but he remained silent. She turned to him, noticing a subtle change in his expression. His face had darkened, and his lower lip was no longer clenched between his teeth. He was staring intently at the lasso he was coiling, and when he finally looked up at her, his eyes blazed with a dark fire. I've been expecting that shorthorn back for months, he said, his voice blunt. Daisy spoke slowly. You never liked Dylan? I should smile, I never did. Ever since I licked him good, don't forget that, Morton interrupted. Daisy remembered the fight between Moore and Dylan. Yes, you licked him, she mused, and Dylan's hated you ever since. There's been no love lost, Moore replied. Daisy was surprised by Moore's sudden animosity towards Dylan. But, Wills, you never before talked this way, spoke out so against Dylan, she protested. Moore shrugged. Well, I'm not the kind to talk behind a fellow's back, but I'm not mealy-mouthed either, and— He trailed off, his meaning unclear. Daisy was unsettled by Moore's behavior. She had always confided in him, but now he seemed distant and cold. She wanted to tell him about a complicated situation she was in, but she felt a strange fear that he would judge her. Despite this, she felt a sense of satisfaction when Moore spoke bitterly about Dylan. She realized that she valued his friendship more than she had thought, and now she felt like it was slipping away. We were such good friends, Pards, she said, trying to lighten the mood. Moore stared at her, confusion evident in his expression. Who? You and me, Daisy replied. Moore's tone softened, but there was still a hint of disapproval in his gaze. What does it matter? Dylan asked, his sudden distance causing Daisy to feel like she had missed him. Something has happened to make me feel like I've missed you lately, that's all, she replied. Dylan's tone was bitter, but he refused to admit anything. Daisy sensed his pride and knew it was the cause of his distance. Why have you been different lately? Daisy asked, feeling a sense of desperation. What's the point in telling you now? Dylan replied, leaving Daisy feeling empty. She had been living in a dream world while he lived in reality. She couldn't seem to understand everything he did. She felt like a child, growing old too quickly. The longing for a mother surged up in her like a strong tide, 
and she needed someone to lean on, someone to love her, someone to help her through this hour of her life. It might be bad for me to hear, but tell me anyway, Daisy said, finally giving in to the feminine impulse rising up in her. No, Dylan declared, his face turning a dark red. He slapped the lasso against his saddle and tied it with clumsy hands, refusing to look at her. His anger and amazement were evident in his tone. Dad says I have to marry Dylan, Daisy said, returning to her natural simplicity. I heard him say that months ago, Dylan snapped. Did you? Is that why? Daisy whispered. Yes, Dylan replied resolutely. But that's no reason for you to stay away from me, Daisy said, her spirit rising. Dylan laughed bitterly. Daisy, a nineteen-year-old girl who's about to get married shouldn't be a fool, he said sarcastically. I'm not a fool, Daisy retorted hotly. You asking some dumb questions, Morton snapped back. Daisy could feel the tension building, a mix of anger and fear that made her heart race. She knew Morton was hurting her, but she couldn't quite put her finger on why. You wouldn't have treated me so bad if you still liked me, she retorted. Morton's face twisted in anger. I ain't mistreating you. You don't know what you're talking about. Daisy could feel her blood boiling. She wasn't used to fighting like this. She felt a pang of fear mixed with the heat of anger. You're calling me a liar, she spat. Morton opened his mouth to speak, but before he could get a word out, Daisy slapped him across the face. She immediately regretted it, feeling the tremble in her own hands. I'm sorry, she stammered. Morton rubbed his cheek, his eyes dark with pain and anger. You slapped me once before years ago, he said, his voice low. For kissing you, I apologize for calling you a liar. We're both just upset. Daisy felt a wave of relief wash over her. Let's make up, be friends again, she said, trying to smooth things over. Morton squared his shoulders, his face hardening. Do you know where Dylan Standish has been for the last three years? he asked, ignoring her attempts at reconciliation. Daisy felt a strange feeling in her gut. No, she said. I heard he went to Denver or maybe Kansas City. He was sent away trying to make something of himself. Morton's bitterness was palpable. I hope to God you're right, he spat. Do you know where he's been? Daisy felt a sudden urge to know. Why do you ask, she said, her curiosity piqued. There was a sense of mystery lingering in the air as Morton's restlessness appeared to run deep. Yeah, I do the cowboy spoke through gritted teeth, almost as if he was fighting an overpowering urge. Daisy's curiosity dissipated as she realized that there might be certain facts that could worsen her situation. Morton, she spoke in haste, I owe everything to my dad. He has always taken care of me, sent me to school, and loved me. I have always cherished him. It would be an ungrateful response if I refuse. Old Devon is the best man there is, Moore interrupted as if to dismiss any hint of disloyalty towards his employer. Everyone in Middle Park and beyond owes something to Devon. He is a good man. There has never been anything wrong with him except his absurd blindness towards his son. Buster Dillon. Daisy placed her hand over Moore's mouth. The man I have to marry, she spoke solemnly. You have to? You will? Morton's cry was piercing, his movements violent, and his eyes intense. Daisy was shaken by the reaction and left trembling and speechless. How can you love Dylan Standish? You last saw him when you were twelve. How can you love him? I don't, Daisy replied. Then how can you marry him? I owe my dad obedience. He hopes that I can help Dylan get his act together. Help Dylan? You, the innocent flower, with your sweetness and purity, help that damn pup? My God, he was a gambler and an alcoholic, Moore exclaimed passionately. Hush. Daisy pleaded. He cheated at cards, the cowboy continued, his tone dripping with disdain for that particular vice. But Dylan was just a wild kid, Daisy tried to defend the man she loved as her father. He's been sent away to work. He'll have outgrown that wildness. He'll come home a man, said Daisy's father. Moore scoffed at the idea, causing Daisy to feel a sinking feeling in her gut. Despite being able to walk and ride for miles, she felt weak in the presence of Moore's harsh words. She tried to hide her weakness, but Moore noticed, and she couldn't help but ask if she was to blame for her chosen life. Moore looked away from her and stood with a hand on his horse, deep in thought. He eventually swung up into the saddle and apologized for his outburst, claiming it was just jealousy. 
Daisy was surprised by this and asked what he could possibly be jealous of. Moore explained that he was a disowned wanderer with no prospects, while their friend Dylan was handsome, rich, and had a doting father with cattle, horses, and ranches. He had won the girl, and Moore couldn't help but feel envious. With that, Moore spurred his Mustang and rode off to drive in a bunch of cattle. Daisy stood there, unsure of what to make of his words. Jealous? He wins the girl? she murmured to herself, her cheeks still hot with the rush of emotions. The words that came out of Morton's mouth made Daisy think about something she never considered before. Maybe he loved her, but if he did, why hadn't he said anything? She felt a bit jealous, but she knew he didn't love her. Then a new feeling emerged within her, a feeling of hope, despair, and longing. She quickly shut it down, not wanting to explore this unknown territory. Her heart felt heavy, and she realized her hands were numb from the cold. Pronto, her horse was nearby, so she mounted him and looked out at the beautiful Colorado sunset. The scenery was breathtaking, with the sage slopes looking like rosy velvet and the golden aspens on fire. The foothills were rich and clear, and the mountains in the distance were purple. The sky was full of wispy clouds and silver. It was all so beautiful, and Daisy felt lucky to call this place her home. She was found as a baby in the forest, and this land belonged to her as much as she belonged to it. Daisy drew strength from the glorious light that shone on the hills. Pronto, her trusty Mustang, perked up his ears and slowed his trot. "'What's up, boy?' she called out. The trail ahead was getting darker as shadows crept up the slope towards her. However, Daisy was not one to be easily deterred by the darkness. She had Pronto, who had a keen sense of sight and smell, and she trusted him to guide her safely through the night. As they rode, Daisy reined Pronto to a halt and listened. All was silent except for the balls of the last straggling cattle of the roundup coming from far on the other side of the ridge. However, Pronto had not perked up his ears for them. Suddenly a wild sound peeled down the slope, making Pronto jump. Daisy recognized it immediately. It's only a wolf, Pronto, she soothed him. The peal was loud, rather harsh at first, then softened to a mournful, wild, lonely, and haunting call. A pack of coyotes barked in angry answer, creating a sharp, staccato, yelping chorus, with the more piercing notes biting on the cold night air. These mountain sounds were music to Daisy's ears. As they continued on down the trail in the gathering darkness, Daisy was less afraid of the night and its wild denizens than of what awaited her at White Slides Ranch. The valley had begun to shade on the far side, and the rose and gold seemed to be fading from the nearer. Below, on the level floor of the valley, lay the rambling old ranch house, with the cabins nestling around, and the corrals leading out to the soft hay fields, misty and gray in the twilight. A single light gleamed like a beacon, and the air was cold with a nip of frost. Daisy steeled herself for what lay ahead and urged Pronto on towards the ranch. Chapter Two Nightfall draped the valley in a cloak of darkness. Daisy had hoped to see Morton waiting to attend to her horse, as he usually did, but she was let down. The cowboy's cabin was dark, indicating that he had not returned from the roundup yet. Daisy proceeded to unsaddle her horse and released Pronto into the pasture. The blackness of the night was pierced by the bright squares of the windows of the long, low ranch house. Daisy felt trepidation as she wondered if Dylan Standish had returned home. She knew she had to meet him and decided to get it over with as soon as possible. She tiptoed past the bright windows, then went all the way down the long porch, turned around and went back. She hesitated, fighting a slow drag of her spirit, feeling an oppression upon her heart. She opened the crude and heavy door and entered a big room lit by a lamp on the upper table and blazing logs in a huge stone fireplace. This was the living room, rather gloomy in the corners, bare but comfortable for all simple needs. The logs were new and the chinks between them filled with clay, still white, showing that the house was of recent build. The rancher, Standish, was sitting in his easy chair before the fire, his big, horny hands extended to the warmth. He was in his shirt sleeves, a gray, bold-faced man of over sixty years, still muscular and rugged. When Daisy entered, he raised his drooping head and so removed the suggestion of sadness in his posture. "'Well, lass, here you are,' was his greeting. Jake has been hollering that Chuck was ready. Now we can eat. Dad, did your son come? asked Daisy. No, I got word just at sundown. One of Baker's cowpunchers from up the valley. 
He rode up from Kremlin and stopped to say Dylan was celebrating his arrival by too much red liquor. Reckon he won't be home tonight. Maybe tomorrow, Standish spoke in an even heavy tone without any apparent feeling. Always he was mercilessly frank and never spared the truth. But Daisy, who knew him well, felt how this news flayed him. Resentment stirred in her toward the wayward son, but she knew better than to voice it. It was natural for Dylan to feel happy upon arriving home, I suppose. I don't blame him for that. These past three years must have been tough for him, the old man mused. Daisy reached her hands out to the fire. It's cold, Dad, she complained. I didn't dress warmly, so I almost froze. Autumn is here and there's a chill in the air. The hills were all gold and red and the aspen leaves were falling. I love autumn, but it means winter is coming soon. Well, well, time sure does fly, sighed the old man. Where did you ride today? I went up the west slope to the bluff. It's a long ride, so I don't go there often, Daisy replied. Did you see any of the boys? I sent them out to drive the stock down from the mountain. We've lost quite a few head lately. They're eating some weed that poisons them. They swell up and die. It's worse this year than ever before. Why, that's terrible, Dad. Poor things. That's worse than eating loco. Yes, I saw Morton Moore driving down the slope, Daisy exclaimed. Uh-huh. Well, let's eat, the old man said. They sat down at the table, and the cook, Jake, brought out the steaming food. Supper seemed to be more luxurious than usual tonight, in anticipation of their expected guest, who hadn't shown up. Daisy helped her father to his favorite dishes while stealing glances at his lined and shadowed face. She sensed a subtle change in him since the afternoon, but couldn't see any outward signs of it in his appearance or demeanor. His appetite was as strong as ever. So you saw Wills. Is he still trying to win you over? Standish asked. No, he's not. I don't think he ever did, Dad, Daisy replied. You're still a child in your mind and a woman in your body. That cowboy has been lovesick over you since you were a little girl. It's what's kept him here riding for me, Standish said. Dad, I don't believe it, Daisy protested, feeling her cheeks flush. You always had thoughts about Morton and the other boys, didn't you? Standish said with a chuckle. I used to be a fool about women, but now I can see clearly. Didn't Wilson always get jealous when any of the other boys tried to get close to you? I can't remember that he did, replied Daisy. She wanted to laugh, but the topic was not amusing to her. Well, you've always been innocent, Standish said. Thank the Lord you never played games like most pretty girls, flirting with every man. Anyway, three months ago I told Wilson to stay away from you because you were not for any poor cowboy. You never liked him. Why? Was it fair, considering he was just a boy? Well, I reckon it wasn't, Standish replied. His face turned red as he looked up. That boy was the best rider and roper I've had in years. He wasn't the kind to break broncos. He never drank. He was honest and willing. He saved his money. He was good at handling stock. That boy will be a rich rancher one day. Strange, then, that you never liked him, murmured Daisy. She felt guilty for feeling good about Morton being praised. No, it ain't strange. I have my own reasons, Standish replied gruffly as he resumed eating. Daisy believed she knew why the old rancher had an unreasonable dislike for this cowboy. It was probably because Morton had always been superior to Dylan Standish in every way. The boys had been natural rivals in everything related to life on the range. What Devon Standish admired most in men was paramount in Morton and lacking in his own son. Will you put Dylan in charge of your ranches now? Daisy asked. Not a chance. I think I'll try him here at White Slides as a foreman. And if he runs the outfit well, then I'll see, Standish replied. Dad, he'll never run the White Slides outfit, Daisy asserted. Well, it's a tough group, I'll admit, but I think the boys will stick around except maybe Wills. And it might be best for him to leave, said Standish. It's not good business to let your best cowboy go. You've been complaining about a shortage of men lately, replied Daisy. I do need more men, admitted Standish. The stock is getting out of control. I sent word to Meeker hoping to get some help. But what I really need right now is someone who knows dogs and can hunt down the wolves, lions, and bears that are preying on my cattle. Dad, you have a whole pack of hounds to handle. There must be at least a hundred of them. And just yesterday someone brought in a bunch of mangy canines. It's kind of funny, really. You're the laughing stock of the range, chuckled Daisy. But the range will thank me when I rid it of all these varmints, declared Standish. 
I swore I'd buy every dog brought to me until I had enough to kill off the coyotes, loafers, and lions. And I'll do it. But I need a hunter. Why not put Morton Moore in charge of the hounds? He's a great hunter, suggested Daisy. That might be a good idea, nodded Standish. But it seems like you're trying to convince me to keep Wilson. Yes, Dad, replied Daisy. Why, do you have feelings for him? asked Standish. I like him, of course. He's been like a brother to me, blushed Daisy. Hmm. Well, are you sure you don't like him more than you should, considering what's going on? questioned Standish. Yes, I'm sure, said Daisy firmly. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It won't matter much whether Will stays or leaves. If he wants to, I'll give him a job with the hounds, decided Standish. That evening, Daisy retired to her cozy bedroom that she had decorated herself. Through the logs of her little refuge, a square window let in the cold autumn air. Daisy loved her isolated home, but tonight the chill was too much, and the lamp's light did little to warm the room. Despite a stone fireplace, Daisy had forgotten to bring in wood to start a fire. She undressed and blew out the lamp, settling into bed. Though the darkness enveloped her, Daisy couldn't sleep. Her mind raced and she tried to clear it. Morton Moore on his white Mustang filled her thoughts. She tried to push him aside, but he persisted with his anger and disapproval, his poignant cry of her name and his mocking talk of jealousy. He grew stronger, even with the old rancher's praise in her mind. I must not think of him, she whispered. Why, I'll be married soon. Married. The word chilled her, and she thought it over. It's true, I'll be married because I ought to, because I must, she said aloud. Because I can't help myself. I ought to want to for Dad's sake. But I don't. I don't. She wanted to be loyal, loving, and helpful to show her gratitude for the home and affection Devon Standish had given her. He had not been obligated to care for a lost child, but he had done it because he was noble. Many such deeds had been done by the old rancher. She wasn't an ungrateful person, but the cost of it all was starting to hit her. This is going to change everything, she whispered to herself in disbelief. Daisy knew she had to go over the details of the change. Her mother had never taught her, and the few women who had come to the Standish home had not stayed long enough to help her. Even her school life in Denver had not prepared her for the serious problems ahead. If I become his wife, she continued, I'll have to be with him. I'll have to give up this little room. I'll never be free, alone, or happy again. That was the first and last detail she could think of. The realization made her shudder. In that moment, an unconscious revolt was born. The coyotes were howling, and their sharp, sweet notes soothed her aching head. They reminded her of the beauty that would never change. The golden-purple sunset, the slopes of sage, and the lonely heights. She drifted off to sleep thinking that tomorrow she would try to persuade Morton not to kill all the coyotes, to leave a few because she loved them. Devon Standish had settled in Middle Park in 1860. It was a wild country, home to the Ute Indians, and a natural paradise for elk, deer, antelope, and buffalo. The mountain ranges were home to bears, and these ranges sheltered the rolling valley land that some explorer had named Middle Park in earlier days. Much of this tableland was prairie, where long grass and wild flowers grew abundantly. Standish saw the potential and became a cattleman. He sought the friendship of Paya, chief of the UTEs, who was well disposed toward the white settlers. During those times of trouble, his tribe kept peace with the invaders of their mountain home. In 1868, the UTEs were convinced by Standish to give up Middle Park. The hills were covered in dense timber, and the mountains were rich in gold and silver. This attracted many prospectors, cattlemen, and lumbermen to the area. Unfortunately, the summer season was too short for growing grain, and the nights were too cold for corn. Otherwise, Middle Park would have seen a rapid increase in population. After the UTEs left, Devon Standish developed several cattle ranches and acquired more land. White Slides Ranch was located about twenty miles from Middle Park and was a winding arm of the main valley land. Standish lived there because the area was wilder and he wanted to keep the loneliness he had experienced in earlier years. As he grew older, Standish became richer in cattle and land, but he never saved any money. He was always willing to help others and never forgot an obligation. He trusted everyone and was proud of the fact that no one had ever betrayed his trust, whether they were white or red. His cowboys took advantage of him and his neighbors imposed on him but they always paid their debts of service or stock.
Standish was one of the great pioneers of the frontier days who helped settle the West. He was even better than most because he showed that the Indians would respond to friendliness if they were not robbed or driven away. On the day that Standish expected his son to arrive at White Slides, he was not seen doing his usual tasks. Instead, he walked around the fields and corrals, paced up and down the porch, and occasionally stayed indoors. He scanned the horizon below, where the road from Kremling showed white down the valley. In the early afternoon, a buckboard pulled into the yard, drawn by horses covered in dust and lather. The cowboys on the ranch came running over to greet the driver, who seemed to be a familiar face. However, Dylan Standish, the driver, didn't acknowledge their presence. He simply threw a bag out of the buckboard and slowly climbed down, making his way towards the porch. "'Hey there, Dylan, my son. I'm mighty glad to see you back home,' said the old rancher, walking towards him with open arms. His voice was deep and full, with a rich tone. But that was the only sign of emotion he showed. "'Howdy, Dad,' replied Dylan, not sounding too enthusiastic as he shook his father's hand. Dylan was tall, with a similar build to his father, but he slouched a little. His face was pale, indicating that he hadn't been exposed to the sun and wind much lately. Any stranger would have seen the resemblance between father and son, but Dylan lacked the strength that his father possessed. His lower face seemed weak, and he appeared ashamed or even sullen. However, if he had been under the influence of alcohol in Kremling, as reported the day before, he had fully recovered. "'Come on in,' said the rancher. Once inside the living room, Standish closed the doors, and Dylan threw his baggage on the floor, turning to face his father with aggression. "'Do they all know where I've been?' he asked bitterly, his face flushing with broken pride and shame. "'Nobody knows. The secret's been kept,' replied Standish, calming his son's nerves. Dylan seemed amazed and relieved. "'Aw, oh, now I'm glad,' he exclaimed, sitting down and half covering his face with his trembling hands. "'Dylan, we'll start over.' said Standish earnestly, his big eyes shining with warmth and beauty. Right here. We won't ever talk about where you've been the past three years, never again. Dylan looked up, his sullenness replaced with a newfound clarity. Father, you were wrong about trying to do good for me. It's only done me harm. But if no one knows the reason why, I'll try to forget it. Maybe I made a mistake, replied Standish, with a hint of sadness in his voice. But I swear to God I meant well. You were— that's enough talking, interrupted Dylan. I'll take on the role of foreman at White Slides, and if I do well, I'll be happy to boss the ranch. You're getting older, and I know you've had some setbacks with rustling and predators. What do you say, father? I say yes, Standish replied. But you should know that the outfit at White Slides is tough. You won't be able to run them with just words. The only way to handle them is to work hard from dawn till dusk, saying little but doing a lot. Dylan wasn't fazed by his father's warning. I'll show them who's boss, he said. I can't wait to ride and tear around the ranch. Standish looked at his son with a mix of pride and doubt. He was overjoyed that his only son was home, but he knew that Dylan needed some guidance. Listen to me, son. You used to be rough with horses. Be gentle with them now. You'll need advice, especially since you've been away from the range for three years. Some cowboys force their horses to behave by making them pitch and bite, but that's not the best way. Horses have sense, and I've got some fine stock that I don't want to spoil. It's important to be easy and quiet with the boys because it's hard to find good help these days. You'd do best, son, to stick to your dad's ways with horses and men, advised Dylan's father. Dad, I've seen you kick horses and shoot at men, replied Dylan. Right, you have. But those were particular bad cases. I'm not advising that way. Son, it's close to my heart that you'll— The old man's voice quavered and broke, showing the deep and unutterable affection he had for his son. Dylan put an arm around his father's shoulder. Dad, I'll make you proud of me yet. Give me a chance, and don't be upset if I can't do wonders right away. You shall have every chance. And that reminds me, do you remember Daisy? asked his father. I sure do, Dylan replied eagerly. They talked about her in Kremling. Where is she? I reckon she's somewhere around. Dylan, you and Daisy are going to get married. Marry? Daisy and me? he exclaimed. Yes, you're my son and she's my adopted daughter. I won't split my property and it's only right that she has a share. Daisy is a fine, strong, quiet, pretty lass and she'll make a good wife. I've set my heart on the idea. But Daisy always hated me, Dylan protested. 
Well, she was just a kid then, and you teased her. Now she's a woman and willing to please me. Dylan, you won't go against this deal, will you? That depends, Dylan replied. I'll marry almost any girl you want me to. But if Daisy were to treat me like she used to, then I'd have to object. Dad, you sure she don't know nothing, suspect nothing about where you sent me? Dylan asked his father. I swear she don't, son, his father replied. So you want us to get hitched soon? Dylan asked. Well, yeah, as soon as Daisy thinks it's reasonable. She's shy, strange, and deep. If you ever win her heart, you'll be richer than if you owned all the gold in the Rockies. I'd say take it slow. But on the other hand, it might be better to tie the knot right away to keep you grounded, his father advised. Get married right away? That's like something out of a story. But I'll wait till I meet her, Dylan laughed. Meanwhile, Daisy was perched on the topmost log of a corral watching two cowboys with a saddled mustang. One of the cowboys carried a canvas sack with horseshoes and tools, which made the mustang snort and jump. "'Miss Daisy, you gonna sit up there?' asked the taller cowboy, a lean and powerful man with a rough red-blue face and steady bright eyes. "'I sure am, Jim,' Daisy replied calmly. "'But we gotta tie him up gently.' Jim scratched his sandy head and looked at his comrade, a little gnarled fellow with all legs. "'You hear that, you Wyoming galoot? Them shoes go on wang right gentle,' he said. Jim grinned and turned to speak to the Mustang. Wang, the law's laid down, and we want to see how much horse sense you got. The shaggy Mustang didn't seem impressed by the speech and gave Jim a distrustful look. Jim, drawled the other cowboy, since this job is the last Miss Daisy will ever boss us on, we got to do it without Wang getting spooked. Lem, why is this the last job I'll ever boss you boys? demanded Daisy. Jim looked at her quizzically while Lem put on his best innocent cowboy face. Well, Miss Daisy, we reckon the new boss of White Slides rode in today. You mean Dylan Standish came home, said Daisy. Well, I'll boss you boys the same as always. That'd be mighty fine for us, but I'm afraid it ain't written in the fate of White Slides, replied Jim. Buster Dylan will run over the old man and marry you, added Lem. Oh, so that's your idea, rejoined Daisy lightly. Well, if such a thing did come to pass, I'd be your boss more than ever. I reckon not, Miss Daisy, for we won't be riding for white sides, said Jim simply. Daisy had sensed this very significance long before when the possibility of Buster Dillon's return had been rumored. She knew cowboys, as well try to change the rocks of the hills. Boys, the day you leave white slides will be a sad one for me, sighed Daisy. Miss Daisy, we ain't gone yet, put in Lem with awkward softness. Jim has long hankered for Wyoming, and he just talks that way. Then the cowboys turned to the business at hand. Jim removed the saddle but left the bridle on, deceiving Wang. He had been broken to stand while his bridle hung, and like a horse that would have been good if given a chance, he obeyed as best he could, shaking in every limb. Jim, apparently to hobble Wang, roped his forelegs together low down but suddenly slipped the rope over the knees. Then Wang knew he had been deceived. He snorted fire, let out a scream, and rearing on his hind legs he pawed the air savagely. Jim tugged on the rope as Wang bellowed and thrashed his forefeet in the air. With a mighty pull, Jim yanked Wang down and Lem grabbed the bridle, flipping the Mustang over and sitting on his head. Jim looped a lasso around one front hoof and pulled the other leg back, securing both with a quick knot. With another loop of the lasso, Jim wrapped the front and back hoofs together, rendering Wang powerless. The cowboys rolled Wang onto his other side, lassoing his free front hoof and pulling it back to the hind one, securing them both. The shoeing continued without issue. Daisy watched the process with unease, but knew she had to stay put. She trusted the cowboys not to be cruel in her presence. He'll be limping tomorrow, Lem said as he stood up from Wang's head. Yeah, and like a mule, he'll hold a grudge for twenty years just to get a chance to kick me, Jim replied with a chuckle. The most intriguing moment for Daisy was when Wang lifted his head to inspect his legs, expressing a mix of intelligence, fear, and fury. The cowboys released him, and he stomped his iron-clad hooves. "'That was a dirty trick, Wang,' Daisy said softly. "'If I owned you, I'd never let them do that to you.' "'You can have him if you want,' Jim offered as he saddled Wang. "'But he's a wild one. Only I can ride him. You up for the challenge?' Daisy chuckled. "'Not in these clothes.' "'Well, Miss Daisy, you're looking mighty fine today for some reason,' remarked Lem as he picked up his tools from the ground. "'Aha!' Uh -huh 
And here comes the reason, added Jim in a low, hoarse whisper. Daisy heard the whisper and the sound of footsteps on the gravel road. She quickly turned and recognized Dylan Standish, the boy she remembered from years ago, now a tall and confident young man. Daisy had feared this meeting, but all she felt was annoyance at being caught sitting on top of the corral fence with little regard for her dignity. She remained seated, smoothing her skirt and waiting for Standish to approach. Jim and Lem led a Mustang out of the corral, seemingly wanting to avoid the young man, but he prevented that. Howdy, boys, I'm Dylan Standish. He introduced himself in a rather haughty manner, but with a nonchalant attitude. He did not offer to shake hands. Jim muttered something, and Lem simply said, How do? That's an ornery-looking horse, Standish commented as he reached out with a careless hand to touch the Mustang, causing it to jerk and pull Jim off balance. Well, he ain't a horse, but I reckon he's all the rest, drawled Jim. Both cowboys appeared slow and careless, neither indifferent nor responsive. Daisy watched as they gave Standish a keen and steady glance before taking a second, less hasty look at him. He was dressed in high-heeled, fancy-topped boots, tight-fitting dark trousers, a heavy belt with a silver buckle, and a white soft shirt with a wide collar open at the neck. He was bareheaded. I'm going to run white slides, Standish informed the cowboys. What are your names? Daisy wanted to giggle, but managed to smother the impulse. Jim was always a bit of a mystery to everyone. No one could ever seem to get his real name out of him. My handle is Lemuel Archibald Divinings, he said with a sly smile. No one had ever heard that middle name before. Standish turned his attention to the only girl on the ranch. The cowboys dropped their heads and shuffled away. There's only one girl on the ranch, so you must be Daisy, he said confidently. That's right, and you're Dylan, she replied, hopping off the fence. I'm glad to welcome you home. Daisy extended her hand, and Dylan held it for a moment longer than necessary. He seemed genuinely surprised and pleased to see her. Well, I'd never have known you, he said, looking her up and down. It's funny, I had the clearest picture of you in my mind. But you're not at all like I imagined. The daisy I remember was thin, white-faced, and all eyes. It's been a long time, seven years, Daisy said. But I knew you. You're older, taller, bigger, but still the same Buster Dillon. I hope not, Dillon said, shaking his head. Dad needs me. He wants me to take charge here to be a man. I'm back now. It's good to be home. I never was worth much. Lord, I hope I don't disappoint him again. I hope so, too, Daisy murmured. Hearing him talk so seriously and honestly made her feel better about him. He seemed earnest. Dylan looked down at the ground and kicked at some pebbles with his boot. Daisy took the opportunity to study his face. He looked like his father with his big handsome head and prominent blue eyes. His face was pale and he seemed to be shadowed by worry or discontent. It was as if he had a repressed character that was just waiting to burst out. His mouth and chin were undisciplined. Daisy couldn't believe that she disliked anything about the young man in front of her. However, there was something about him that kept her at a distance. She had made a decision to be selfless and find the good in him, like him for it, and be strong enough to endure and help. Despite her efforts, she couldn't control her strange and vague perceptions. Why couldn't she see in him what she saw in Jim Montana, Lem, or Morton Moore? This is my second long time away from home, Standish began. The first was when I went to school in Kansas City. I enjoyed it. I was upset when they kicked me out and sent me back home. But the last three years were terrible. His face contorted and a dark flush crossed it. Did you work? Daisy asked. Work? It was worse than work. Of course I worked, he replied. Daisy looked at his hands sharply. They were as smooth and unblemished as hers. If he was telling the truth, what kind of work had he done? Well, if you work hard for my dad, learn how to manage the cowboys and leave those old bad habits alone. You mean drinking and gambling? I swear I've forgotten about them for three years until yesterday. I think I've got the better of them. Then you'll make my dad and me happy. You'll be happy too, Daisy said, feeling a sense of refinement in him. Despite his wild and reckless youth, there was good in him. Dad wants us to get married he said suddenly, with a mixture of shyness and amusement. Isn't that funny? You and I used to fight like cats and dogs. Do you remember when I pushed you into the old mud hole, and you waited for me behind the house with a rotten cabbage? Yes, I remember, Daisy replied, lost in thought. 
It feels like a lifetime ago, Dylan Standish reminisced, a smile playing on his lips. Remember when you ate my pie and I got even by tearing off your little dress, leaving you almost without a stitch on? Daisy blushed. I must have been very little then. You were a little devil, Dylan chuckled. Do you remember the fight I had with Moore about you? Daisy remained silent, not wanting to bring up the past. She disliked the fleeting expression that crossed Dylan's face. He remembered too well. I'll settle that score with Moore, Dylan declared. Besides, I won't have him on the ranch. Dad needs good hands, Daisy reminded him, her eyes on the gray sage slopes. Mention of Morton Moore only increased her aloofness. An annoyance pricked along her veins. Before we get any further, I'd like to know something. Has Moore ever made a move on you? Daisy felt a hot, sharp wave of blood rush to her face. Why was she at the mercy of strange, quick, unfamiliar sensations? Why did she hesitate over that natural question from Dylan Standish? No, he never has, she replied eventually. That's damn queer, Dylan said, puzzled. You used to like him better than anybody else. You sure hated me. Daisy, have you outgrown that? Yes, of course, Daisy answered. But I hardly hated you. Dad said you were willing to marry me. Is that so? Dylan asked kindly. Daisy dropped her head. His question did not offend her, for it had been expected. But Dylan's actual presence, the meaning of his words, stirred in her an unutterable spirit of protest. She had already agreed to the old man's demand in her will, but she was learning now that she could not force herself to surrender to a desire she did not have. Yes, I'm willing, she replied bravely. Soon? Dylan asked eagerly. If I had my way, it wouldn't be too soon, Daisy faltered. She had noticed him approaching, and her eyes dropped to the ground as she felt the urge to flee. Why not soon? Standish spoke with confidence. Dad thinks it'd be good for me. It'd give me responsibility. I reckon I need it. Wouldn't it be better to wait a while? Daisy questioned, hesitant. We don't know each other, let alone care. Daisy, I've fallen in love with you, he declared, his voice full of passion. Oh, how could you? cried Daisy, surprised. I always had a crush on you when we were kids, he admitted. And now to see you all grown up so pretty and sweet, such a healthy, blooming girl. And Dad's word that you'll be my wife soon, mine. I just went off my head at the sight of you. Daisy looked up at him, remembering how as a boy he had always passionately longed for things he wanted and would have, and his father had never denied him. It could be possible that Dylan had genuinely fallen in love with her. Would you want to take me without my love? she asked, her voice low. I don't love you now. I might someday if you were good, if you made Dad happy, if you conquered. I'd take you even if you hated me he interrupted, consumed by his passion. I'll tell Dad how I feel, she said faintly. And marry you when he says. He kissed her, but she pushed him away before he could embrace her. Don't. Someone will see, she warned. Daisy, we're engaged, he laughed, confident in his possession. Say, you needn't look so white and scared. I won't eat you, but I'd like to. Oh, you're a sweet girl. Here I was hating to come home. Oh, man, can you believe my luck? Dylan exclaimed. Then, with a sudden change in demeanor that spoke volumes about his character, he dropped his bold and masterful facade and revealed his softer side. Daisy, I've never been any good, he confessed. But I want to be better. I'll prove it to you. I need to come clean about everything. I can't marry you with any secrets between us. You might find out later and end up hating me. Do you have any idea where I've been for the past three years? No, replied Daisy. I'll tell you right now, but you have to promise never to tell anyone else or hold it against me, he said hoarsely, his face turning white. Suddenly Daisy thought of Morton Moore. He had known where Dylan had been all those years, but he had resisted the temptation to tell her. That was as noble of him as it was base of Dylan to keep it a secret. Dylan, that's really big of you, she said quickly. I respect you for it, but you don't have to tell me. I'll take your word for it. Dylan appeared to be shocked, relieved, and grateful all at once. In an instant, he seemed like a different person. Daisy, if I didn't love you before, I love you now, he declared. That was going to be the hardest thing I ever had to do, tell you my story. But now I won't have to feel ashamed in front of you, and I won't feel like a liar or a cheat. But I will tell you this. If you love me, you'll make a man out of me. Chapter 3 The ranch owner decided it would be best to wait until after the roundup before handing over the foreman position to his son. 
While this was a wise decision, Dylan didn't agree. It was clear that his already intolerant nature had only worsened during his time away. Standish argued with Dylan, explaining that during the fall roundup the appointed foreman should have absolute control. Dylan reluctantly gave in, but immediately went to the corrals where some of the cowboys who had ridden all day and stood guard all night had just come in. They were tired, dirty, and unhappy. One cowboy said that he wouldn't work for the outfit again because he was tired of doing two men's work. Morton Moore told the cowboys to turn in and sleep until they returned with the chuck wagon. Bloodsoe, a cowpuncher who appeared to be crippled or very lame, asked Moore if he was tired. Moore replied that he had only had three hours of sleep in four nights. Bloodsoe asked what a biped was, but no one answered him. The cowboys joked with each other about Moore's education and his roping skills. Dylan Standish appeared, but the cowboys paid him no attention as they tended to their horses and prepared for the day ahead. A young Mexican boy had arrived with a group of horses, including the mottled white Mustang that Moore often rode. Standish leaned forward with interest as Moore whistled and the Mustang showed his affection towards his rider. It was evident that Spotty disliked the Mexican boy and preferred Moore's company. Spotty, you'll be dragging yearlings around today, the cowboy said as he caught the Mustang. Spotty tossed his head and stepped high until the bridle was on. Once the saddle was in place, the Mustang looked even more impressive. He was a beautiful horse, but not too graceful or sleek or fine-pointed or prancing to prejudice any cowboy against his qualities for work. Dylan Standish walked all around Spotty, admiring him a little too closely for the Mustang's comfort. More, he's a fair-to-middling horse, Standish said with the air of a horse expert. What's his name? Spotty, replied Moore shortly as he prepared to mount. Hold on, will you? Dylan ordered peremptorily. I like this horse. I want to inspect him. When he took the reins from the cowboy's hand, Spotty jumped as if he had been shot. Standish jerked at him and went closer. The Mustang reared, snorting and plunging to get loose. Then Dylan Standish showed the sudden temper for which he was known. Red stained his pale cheeks. Damn you, come down, he shouted infuriated, and with both hands he gave a powerful thrust. Spotty came down, trembling all over, his ears laid back, his eyes showing fear and pain. Blood dripped from his mouth where the bit had cut him. "'I'll teach you to stand,' said Standish darkly. "'Moore, lend me your spurs. I want to try him out.' "'I don't lend my spurs or my horse,' replied the cowboy calmly, with a stride that put him within reach of Spotty. The other cowboys had dropped their equipment and stood at attention with intent gaze and silent lips. Is that your horse? Dylan asked, his face turning red. I reckon so, Moore replied slowly. No one else has ever ridden him. Does my dad own him or do you? Dylan asked. Well, if you're thinking that way, he belongs to White Slides, the cowboy answered. I never bought him. I raised him from a colt and broke him in myself. I knew it. He's mine and I'm going to ride him now, Dylan declared. Can one of you cowboys lend me some spurs? No one moved. There was a tension in the air that Standish couldn't quite grasp. I'll ride him without spurs, he said, turning to mount the Mustang. Standish, it'd be better if you didn't ride him now, Moore said calmly. Why not? Standish demanded, his temper flaring. He's the only horse left for me to ride. We're branding today. Hudson got hurt yesterday and I was appointed to fill his place. I have to rope yearlings. If you get on Spotty, you'll excite him. He's high-strung and nervous. That won't be good for him, since he hates cutting out and roping. Standish didn't seem to understand the logic behind the cowboy's words. Maybe it'll interest you to know that I'm the foreman of White Slides, he said haughtily. Well, 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 Moore replied. I'm sure interested now. With swift hands, he unbuckled the cinch and pulled the saddle and blanket off the horse. Standish stared, not quite sure what was happening. Then his anger flared. What are you doing? Put that saddle back, he shouted. No way, this is my saddle. I paid sixty dollars for it in Kremling last year. It's a good hard-earned saddle, and you can't ride it. Understand? asked Moore with a smirk. Yeah, I understand, replied Standish, his anger evident in his tone. Listen up, I'm going to have you fired. Sorry, too late, said Moore coolly. I already quit when you showed no regard for that horse. You quit? Good riddance, I wouldn't want you here anyway, retorted Standish. You couldn't have kept me, Buster Dillon, replied Moore, using Standish's range name. Don't you dare call me that, yelled Standish, his fury growing. Why not? 
It's your handle. We all have one. There's Montana, blood, let me two bits. They call me Professor. Why do you have a problem with yours? asked Moore, feigning innocence. I won't tolerate it, not from you or anyone else, spat Standish. Sure thing, it'll stick, though, replied Moore sarcastically. It suits you. Don't you break everything you touch. Your old man will be thrilled when you break the roundup today and the outfit tomorrow. You insolent cowpuncher, shouted Standish, his rage boiling over. Shut up or I'll punch your face in. Shut up? Me? Not gonna happen. This is a free country, Buster Dillon, retorted Moore, unrelenting. Moore's repetition of the range name only served to fuel Standish's anger. I always hated you, he yelled before taking a swing at Moore. The first punch missed, but the second landed a glancing blow on Moore's face. Moore regained his balance and retaliated with a punch of his own, causing Standish to stumble back into the corral fence. You're crazy, Buster Dillon, cried Moore, his eyes flashing. Do you really think you can beat me after being gone for three years? Standish flew into a rage, swinging his arms wildly like a madman. Moore dodged the punches thrown by Standish and landed a solid punch on his opponent's mouth, causing him to fall to the ground. Standish quickly got up but did not make another move towards Moore. He had a dark and angry expression on his face and was panting heavily. Moore, I'll kill you, he hissed, searching for a weapon among the cowboys. Bloodsoe was the only one carrying a gun, and Standish made a quick move to grab it before Bloodsoe could stop him. Let go! Give me that gun! By God, I'll fix him! Standish yelled as Bloodsoe struggled with him. Bloodsoe managed to pull the gun free, but Standish continued to fight for it. The gun fell to the ground, and Bloodsoe yelled for someone to grab it before Standish could. Lem ran in and kicked the gun towards the fence, where Jim was able to secure it. Lem then grabbed Standish and scolded him for his reckless behavior. The boss is coming, Jim warned as the rancher approached. The old man had a stern look on his face and demanded to know what was going on. The cowboys released Standish, who sulked off towards the house, muttering to himself. Dylan, stand your ground, called the old man, but his son paid him no heed. As Standish looked back at Moore, he saw no one else around. Boss, there was a little argument, Jim explained, attempting to downplay the situation. Jim, you're a liar, the old rancher replied, causing Jim to feel embarrassed. What are you hiding? Hey, what's going on here? said Jim, noticing the commotion between Bloodsoe and Standish. Bloodsoe handed Jim the gun, claiming it was his, but Standish wasn't convinced. He knew the cowboys were lying to protect Dylan. Devon, the old rancher, was also aware of their deception. You can't fool me, Bloodsoe, Devon said calmly, returning the gun to its rightful owner. Did Dylan do something? Bloodsoe admitted that Dylan had caused trouble, and Morton Moore confirmed it. Dylan had hurt Moore's horse, and Devon was outraged. He loved horses and couldn't tolerate any mistreatment. Devon examined the horse's mouth, which was cut badly. He took off the bridle and expressed his sympathy for the animal. Moore explained that Dylan had caused the injury when they were just trying to saddle up. Devon's anger simmered as he listened to the story. He knew he had to confront Dylan and put an end to his reckless behavior. The Mustang caught Dylan's eye, and he was eager to ride him. Spotty was known to be skittish around strangers, causing Dylan to yank on the bridle when the horse reared. Unfortunately, the bit cut into Spotty's mouth, which angered me, but I didn't say anything. Dylan wanted to ride Spotty, but I objected because I was appointed foreman for the day and I needed Spotty. Dylan argued that the Mustang was his, which frustrated me. He wasn't technically mine, so I conceded. When I took off the saddle, which was mine, Dylan became furious and threatened to have me discharged. I told him that I had already quit. Our tempers flared, and I called him Buster Dylan. He punched me first, and then we fought. I was winning until he went for Bloodsoe's gun. That's the end of the story. Bloodsoe interjected, Boss, I'm telling you, he would have shot Wills if he had gotten my gun. He almost had it. The old man calmly stroked his beard, unfazed by the revelation. Montana, what do you think? he asked, turning to the quiet cowboy. Well, boss, Jim reluctantly replied, Buster Dillon's temper was bad before, but now it's worse. Standish gestured to Moore, feeling compelled to speak. Wills, it's unfortunate that you had a clash with Dillon right away, but it was to be expected. I believe Dillon was in the wrong. That horse was rightfully yours. By law, Spotty may have belonged to White Slide's ranch and me, but I'm giving him to you. Moore gratefully replied, Thank you, Standish. I really appreciate it.
Devin Standish would do it, no doubt about that, said Moore. Hey, Lem, I'd appreciate it if you stayed on today and helped with the branding. All right, I'll do it for you, replied Lem, picking up his bridle. Guess I won't be getting any sleep till tonight. Later that afternoon, Daisy sat on the porch, watching the sunset after a quiet day indoors. She had only seen Dylan once, riding by towards the pasture, and hadn't seen the old rancher since breakfast. She heard his footsteps pacing in his room, though. The last balls and bellows of cattle had died away, signaling the end of the branding for the fall, and Daisy felt relieved. As the sun set, the wind grew colder and cooled her face. She had cried enough in the solitude of her room that day to scald her cheeks. Suddenly she saw a cowboy riding slowly down the lane between the pastures, leading another horse. It was Lem, and he was leading Pronto, Daisy's beloved Mustang. But something was wrong. Pronto was limping. Daisy ran to the corral gate in dismay. Oh, Lem, Pronto's hurt, she cried. Well, I should say he is, replied Lem, his serious face indicating something bad had happened. The cowboy was covered in dust and looked exhausted to the point of stumbling. Lem, he's bleeding! exclaimed Daisy as she rushed towards Pronto. Hold up, wait a minute, Lem ordered impatiently. Pronto's cut up real bad, and we need some linen and salve right now. Daisy hurried off to do as she was told, and she returned to the corral so fast that she was out of breath. Pronto whinnied as she fell to her knees beside Lem, who was examining the bloody gashes on the Mustang's legs. Well, it looks like he'll be okay, Lem said with relief. But he had a close call. Now help me to fix him up. I'll help panted Daisy. I've done this kind of thing before, but never with Pronto. Oh, I was so scared that he'd been gored by a steer. He came pretty close, replied Lem grimly. And if it hadn't been for your riding skills, that ornery Texas steer would have gotten him for sure. Who was riding? Was it you, Lem? asked Daisy, grateful for his help. No, it wasn't me, said Lem. It was Wils, and he made me promise not to tell you anything about it. Wils? Did he save Pronto? asked Daisy, surprised. And he didn't want you to tell me? Lem, something's not right. You're acting strange. Miss Daisy, I'm just exhausted, replied Lem wearily. Once I finish bandaging Pronto, I'll probably fall right off my horse. But you're not even on your horse now, Lem, Daisy said with a nervous laugh. What happened? Did you hear about the argument this morning? asked Lem. No, what argument? You can ask old Devon about that. The reason why Pronto got hurt was because Buster Dillon rode out to where we were branding and jumped his horse over a fence into the pasture. He had a rope, and he started chasing some horses over there. One of the cowboys, Pronto, had somehow managed to get the noose around his neck, but he broke free and jumped over the fence. Unfortunately, one of the aggressive steers chased after him, and he tripped on the rope, falling to the ground. The steer was right on top of him, and Pronto was terrified. He managed to find some rough ground and ran into some dead brush, which cut him up badly. Meanwhile, the steer was still after him, and Wils yelled for a rifle, but no one had one. Just as it seemed like Pronto was done for, Wils rode in and saved him. However, that wasn't the end of it. Daisy could tell from Lem's demeanor that something else had happened. She demanded to know what it was, and Lem reluctantly told her that Wils had been hurt. His horse had fallen on him and broken his leg, and his foot was badly smashed. They were taking him to Kremlin for treatment. Daisy's heart sank at the news, and she couldn't believe that something like this could happen on the range. Lem thoughtfully reflected, Buster Dillon caused quite a scene today. Miss Daisy, I don't know how you feel about that man, but I'm telling you, for your own good, he's trouble. He has inherited his father's bad temper, which easily flares up for no reason, and he has never been disciplined. To make matters worse, he's been spoiled and acts like a wild horse that's tasted loco weed. Can you believe he tried to rope Pronto during the roundup? It's like he just arrived in the West. Old Devon may not be a fool, but he's blinded by his love for his son. I'm predicting some rough times ahead for White Slides Ranch.